CE members. Yeah, it's pretty standard. NZGS dominates. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, we've had a good split of our CSOC, sorry. Sorry, guys. Um, for the CSOC members, I'm going to talk about dispersion, so I apologise in advance, but hopefully I can explain it uh, well enough. Okay, so the presentation I'm going to sort of provide here, um, I'm going to start with best practice, or actually explaining some of the methods that are used, and then I'm going to talk through a lot of different projects where we've used our best practice approach in terms of characterising, and obviously a lot going on in terms of um, ground motion, side effects, um, and really part of that is ensuring that we have really good information in terms of classifying our sites. And there is certainly a spectrum in terms of uh, classification approach or what's available, and we want to ensure that we're moving towards best practice, because if we don't have a good characterization of a site, then if we want to start to calculate or assess anything from there, we're already on the back foot. Um, so acknowledgements first, you know, collaborating across a lot of agencies, and that's not everyone there, particularly through uh, Quake Core on the research side of things with uh, University of Auckland, University of Canterbury and GNS Science. Couldn't do any research without any money. We try to. We do a lot of work off the smell of an oily rag, but we've had good funding in terms of, particularly with myself, I think EQC have supported me since 2004 in one way or another, so that's been really good. Quake Core and the research is going on there, University of Auckland funding there, Callaghan with links with some of the work that I've been doing tied with industry, and then again also with MB. Uh, particularly acknowledge Brady Cost, uh, Ken Stokey and Clint Wood, who are collaborators who have been working with since 2010 in this subject. Uh, sort of been lucky enough to be embedded with probably the top people in the field related to geophysical investigations to really, I guess, I think without that, I may not have the knowledge base that I do, and I'm certainly grateful in terms of all the research and work and the knowledge uh, that's been passed on and collated. So what, what was the sort of motivation behind this talk is, you know, we've had a lot of earthquakes recently, and those earthquakes have really highlighted the, the impact of site effects. Um, Canterbury and, uh, and Wellington in the last few years. Uh, so you've got basin effects, basin edge effects, which you hear a lot, and then also topographic effects. And none of that's really, we're indicating that none of that is 1D response. So that's interesting when we come back to classifying a site. If 1D response doesn't dominate, how do we classify a site? Uh, and then we've got very complex soil profiles that I'll go through, particularly Auckland's an interesting example of that. So if we want to do a really robust job in terms of site classification, what dictates our site response and our site amplification is the, effectively the stiffness of that soil column. So we need to be doing dynamic site characterization. We need to be characterizing shear wave velocity. If we want to say to ourselves, we're pushing forward in the industry and we're really trying to do a really good job of characterizing that site response, if we're not measuring shear wave velocity or some sort of aspect in terms of dynamics of the site, we're not pushing forward in terms of our classification approach. Um, so we can use that, one, to understand the ground motions of past earthquakes, so that requires robust characterization to do the back calculation to understand if we can actually capture those response from rock to the ground surface, and we've got a heap of those uh, from past earthquakes. Um, then moving forward, if we want to move forward and improve our design and assessment and be able to sort of uh, revise and create, I guess, better designs based on that combined site as well as the structural response, we need to do a robust approach in terms of that characterization. And then sort of a key aspect as part of all of that is this basin, sedimentary, sedimentary basins, the effect of those on ground motion as we've seen in previous uh, events. And that's, as I said, that all comes back to requiring high quality site characterization data, and so we really need to take best practice. So if we take a real simple view, real, real simple view of seismic design, if we start at the top, we've got we're feeding in from two sides. We're feeding in what we know about the performance or the response or the characteristics of different materials, and we have standards for particular materials, concrete, steel, timber, etc., where we've characterized design codes, and those have all been defined based on really rigorous material testing and very rigorous component testing. So that testing and also past experience is fed into the development of those codes. On the loading side of things, really the, 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 the loadings code is defined 
in many senses in terms of your national seismic hazard model. I'm not covering everything here, but I'm just going to focus in on that side of things as it relates to my talk, the national seismic hazard model. And part of the characterization or the development of the national seismic hazard model is where we've got records and we understand response is geotechnical and geophysical site investigation and uh, different levels in terms of the quality of those. So if we then think, OK, what's our, what's our material testing requirements? If we look on the material side, we have pretty rigorous material testing that's required to ensure that the material we use on site to construct any of our infrastructure meets those requirements. And if, the, and if there is issues, and we've seen issues in Auckland, you have to remove that material and replace it. So there's very, very rigorous standards on that material side. What's going on? On the seismic hazard side of things, Z factor and your near fault factor is location, so usually you, ha you want to build in a place, so you can't really change that. Your R factor is defined based on the importance of the structure you're defining, so usually you can't really shift that. You're building something for a particular purpose. So really the only thing on that side is your site factor. So your site factor there is really where you are characterizing the material on that side of things. So you again need that geo geotechnical and geophysical site investigation. So how robust is this framework compared to this framework? And what's more important? Um, I'm not going to answer what's more important, but I think we should probably ensuring we've got a robust framework on both sides. OK, so if we split that up to geotech and ge geophysical site investigation. So geotech, you've got your standard geotechnical site investigation tools, which are a key and important part of characterizing your site. So, SPT, CPT, DMT, they are all aligned by New Zealand or international standards in terms of the practice, and they've got a long history, and we've got uh, contractors in New Zealand who do a very good job uh, of aligning those standards and also with their background knowledge to apply those methods. If we go into the geophysical side of things, on our invasive methods, so cross-hole and downhole investigation methods, there are standards, to, standards related to those, but those standards are pretty wide open in terms of interpretation, which, if you've got a standard that's very uh, open to interpretation, often that's going to bring issues. So that's probably not the most ideal thing in terms of uh, on that geophysical side of things to have something that's open to interpretation, because that can lead to issues. If we go to surface wave methods, there's no, there's no standards or no guidelines. Well, there's guidelines for HVSR or the Nakamura methods, uh, from international, but for active and passive surface wave methods, there's absolutely no standards or guidelines available, which obviously is not sort of ideal in terms of that. So, whereas the geotechnical side of things, th there will always be a need for those, but if we want to do site classification, we also need to combine our geotechnical investigation methods with geophysical investigation methods. Again, if we're looking at site response, we need to understand our shear wave velocity that dictates the amplification of our site. So because this site is open to presentation or has no standards at all, we're, issues may sort of develop based on those. If we link that into what's the importance of that is to define our site subsoil class. We'll forget about uh, spectral shape, whether that's right or wrong, or the national size of hazard model. If the hazard's right, we're not talking about that there. That's a whole other factor. But in terms of our site subsoil class, there has been a revision, and I think the hierarchy of this is good. So our first one, measurements of shear wave velocities, that's combined geotechnical and geophysical. You're, gonna, you're either going to uh, push something to the ground, or you, and if you push something to the ground, you're going to get a characterization of the material, and then you're going to measure those velocities. So that's measured shear wave velocities, so that's a combined approach. Shear wave velocities by geophysical, so that's surface wave methods that are constrained by information from site profiles. So again, that's combined, that's good, geotechnical and geophysical methods. Shear wave velocities from empirical correlations, that's not geophysical, that's geotechnical with correlations. So if those correlations have been developed for, your, for the region, you've probably got confidence in them. If they haven't been developed for your region, you've got no idea. And often those correlations don't include what's the uncertainty involved in those correlations. So that's another aspect that needs to be accounted for. <laughs> Borehole logs, that's purely geotechnical. That gives you nothing in terms of the dynamic characteristics of the site. So I don't really think that's probably appropriate if you want to classify a site. If you did, you'd probably want to be penalized for not doing a robust job. The Nakamura methods is, again, a geophysical technique. 
I'd argue that might want to shift around. That gives you a characterization of the overall soil, soil profile. But again, that is also requires a bit of expertise and you need to have an understanding of the geotechnical and certainly the geological background of your site. And then the last two, geotechnical and geological. So if we want to move forward and really be doing a robust job in terms of site classification, we probably want to remove those and we want to be measuring something about the dynamic response of our site to classify our site. Um, if we then sort of look at how that affects in terms of our site soil, subsoil class, we have our, our five soil classes there. Probably the big thing that's the issue is that C to D and uh, you below or above your 0.6 seconds. We then have this uh, update where you've got a varied um, spectral shape based in terms of our site period that we're, we're smearing between the two. If we want to be using those and we want to be get a robust characterization in terms of are we in a C or a D or if we actually we want to move and we actually want to do that, we want to be making sure we're using robust methods to classify now. Because if we're, be, we're being more refined in terms of our classification, we better hope that we're using more refined approaches to be able to use that more refined approach. Otherwise, we should be penalised and we shouldn't be able to use that refined approach. And any, the only way you're going to be able to measure site period is by using geophysical methods combined with those geotech methods. The site period, I think, is a really good summary in uh, Larkin and Van Hout that's been published and got a couple of awards from NZSE and NZGS about different methods that you can use. Uh, and I won't really go those, go those, uh, go into those into too much detail. There's different methods that can be utilised, and the main one really requires that you understand the velocity profile down to bedrock. The big issue in New Zealand is, prob is probably what is bedrock, um, and. Certainly, I'd see that it's probably been utilised incorrectly in a lot of cases, and uh, we have stiff rock, soft rock, and stiff rock, and all sorts of things going on. So that's a big question, and I don't have an answer for you in terms of that, because that changes depending on what region you're in. Okay, so we'll go through, in a real uh, simple sense, into some of these invasive methods, and then go a little bit more into the surface wave methods, because uh, that's the ones where things are a bit more complicated. So we have invasive methods, we have I guess we can group them into our downhole methods and then our crosshole methods. So our downhole methods are probably the ones we use the most. So a downhole and a borehole, or a seismic CPT, which is effectively the same as a, as a, as a, um, a borehole. And often, in a New Zealand context, a seismic CPT will be using a single receiver or a single geophone at depth. Uh, we then have dual receiver. Again, you can use a dual receiver approach using a borehole. Uh, and then in New Zealand context, usually we have a dual receiver in our seismic DMT. So you have two geophones downhole. And I'll show you the importance of that in the next couple of slides. Uh, crosshole methods, which I won't go into too much detail. Again, you can use a crosshole methods. The AST standard for a borehole crosshole is to use three boreholes, source in one, and then two receivers. And you look at the difference between these two. Obviously, that's really expensive. So pretty much always for crosshole, you use two boreholes. Again, this has some of the issues that I'll talk about in the next couple of methods, but there is ways you can deal with it. And if you've got a good system, you can get a good result. Uh, and then and the other crosshole method is the direct push crosshole uh, that, I, that University of Texas and I have developed and it's been used um, in a couple of different applications. The key thing for all these is data acquisition system is key. If you have a $120 data acquisition system, that's gonna cause you problems. And the reason for that relates to triggering. So if we look at a real simple sense, our single receiver seismic, we use what is, what is called the pseudo interval method. So you've got your borehole, your CPT, you've got a single geophone, which measures velocity uh, at, a, at, a, at a depth, and then you've got your source, so your shear beam at an office from the offset from the borehole. So you apply an impact, your uh, data acquisition system then triggers the recording so that's your zero time. We have an assumed ray path usually, often that's not straight line. Are we able to actually work out what that path is? No, is, is the simple answer, but we do the best we can. And that travels, and then it's, the signal is picked up. So the time it takes to travel that assumed ray path is dependent on the trigger and then when it's recorded. So the trigger is key. For the pseudo interval method, you then measure that and you've got one trace and then you push it down and you do the same thing again. Impact, trigger, assumed ray path signal recorded. 
if your trigger isn't consistent, or you don't measure your trigger, or you don't know that your trigger isn't consistent, then your velocities won't, will not make sense. And often you'll see a seismic CPT trace that goes like this. It's probably not very representative of the soil. It's because your trigger's not very good. So the typical way is to look at pseudo, they call it pseudo interval, because you just take the, the measurements from two depths and you use the difference of that to calculate your velocity. If your trigger's great and your recording system's great, then you're good. And you, if you can record your trigger, even better, because you account for it. But if your trigger system is bad, then you've got no idea. And so there is ways you can deal with it. So it's not, this is not saying that seismic CPT or borehole method's bad. There is other processing methods available, like the slope method, where you actually plot those out and you create slopes in the different geologic units, and that gives you a, a real good representation of your velocity. Um, so you just, it's, there's different ways that you can uh, analyze those approaches. If we go to two receivers, the good thing about that is that timing is in a factor, because your start time is the same for both receivers. So for the dual receiver, you create an impact, triggers, even if it's not the greatest data acquisition system, the trigger is the same, the start time is the same for both those rays. So it eliminates that issue with the trigger, and you're just looking at the difference between those two times. So that helps to deal with that issue. Um, so that's sort of a, some of the issues related to some of those invasive methods that you, wanna ha you may have to deal with. And that's why you might see some funny things. I've actually seen my colleague sent me a, a seismic CPT trace with a negative velocity, which I thought was pretty amazing. So that's someone who's doing the investigation who doesn't know what's going on. So that's the easy stuff. <laughs> um, surface wave methods is a whole other kettle of fish altogether. So the surface wave methods, and I'm sort of, I'll, I'll, I'll match this to some of those methods that we've talked about. So surface wave methods are the, is a three-step process, acquisition, processing, and inversion. And they're all as important as, as each other. And the way that we can sort of split this up is acquisition, you're gonna have to do a really robust field methodology so it's going in the field using an operator who knows what's going on, it's collecting that data in a really robust way. And so that is the same as uh, a really uh, experienced CPTD, SPT DMT, or a, a driller who understands the site conditions, how the site conditions can affect your um, collection of data. So you've got a really in the field robust methodology. So I would sort of say that the just the acquisition step aligns with the CPT DMT driller sort of approach. You, so one step, if you, do, if you do a poor job of that, you've already lost before you've even started. So you've got to do a really good job in terms of that. The next step is to take that data and process it, and I'm not going to go into detail on this because that's sort of a three-day lecture. So the processing, you know, you need expertise to then take that field data and pr process that data into a form that you can then take on the surface wave side of things to the inversion. So the acquisition and the processing I'd probably align with someone who understands how to do a seismic CPT, seismic DMT, a downhole or a crosshole, right? So you're doing robust field acquisition and then you're processing and interpreting that data to develop your shear wave velocity profiles. So I think those is where you sort of align in terms of how you could match those different methods. The final step in the surface wave method is that inversion approach. And that is where things can go haywire very quickly, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And so that requires modeling, uh, is not just interpreting field data, it's creating a model to match the field data. So it's a whole other level of complexity. Uh, and if you use a black box, you get what you put in, which is very little. And the key thing there is this is uncertain. So there shouldn't be a single velocity profile output. There should be multiple. And that's a, a sort of a key factor. So to do that, I have to talk about wave propagation, sorry, structural engineers, but that's the way it goes. So why do they call it surface wave methods? So surface wave methods is because they use waves that travel along the surface of a medium, so the surface of the earth. And so pretty much vast majority of the time, you're using Rayleigh waves. And then sometimes, if you've got sites that would require it, or if you see that you're gonna have an issue, you would use love waves. So these are waves that travel along the surface of a medium, a Rayleigh wave goes like this as it moves forward, as those pictures sort of show, and then a love wave moves forward and goes side to side. So they only occur along the, along the surface of a medium, 
a short wavelength goes only a shallow depth along the medium and a long wavelength goes a deeper depth into the medium. And the reason we use this is because surface waves are what is termed dispersive, which means that different wavelengths travel at different velocities in a layered medium. If, the pro if, if we had a medium with a property, if the velocity was the same from the surface all the way down, they would all move at the same velocity because the velocity is constrained by those properties. But soil is usually layered, and because it's layered, if you have different wavelengths, which we can relate to depth, a shallow wave might travel. So if this, if this is a layered deposit looking on the side, this is, this, say this velocity is 100, this is 200, and this is 400, say. If we have a short wavelength, so, so a short wavelength is only going into a shallow depth, it's only traveling through that shallow layer, its velocity is gonna be constrained or defined only by that shallow layer. If we go a bit deeper, this wavelength, it's moving through the top layer and the layer below. So its velocity is a function of the velocity of both those layers. And because the velocity is getting stiffer with depth, that longer wavelength moves faster than the shorter wavelength. And if you keep on going all the way through, and the deeper one, so this is even uh, deeper, so now the sort of average velocity that it's experiencing is the largest of all, it will move faster than the shorter wavelength and the shorter wavelength. So that means if we can create a source that has energy across a range of wavelengths, we can characterize the soil profile with a range of depths. And that's why we use uh, the surface waves. That characteristic is really useful for us to be able to characterize the velocity with depth in the soil profile. There's also the fact that if you hit a plate on the ground, two thirds of the energy is surface waves. So that means it's also efficient. So that's why we use surface waves, and that's a unique characteristic that both love waves and radio waves have. And that means we can characterize the velocity profile with depth in sort of an average sense, as you can see. So there's different methods that we can use. The active source, which you would have heard, the MASW multi-channel analysis of surface waves, and the passive source. So the active source is you, you, you know that you create a source of the ground. Passive source, you're using background vibrations. There's different methods. 2D array methods, REMI is a method that is a passive source but it's a 1D array which then has some issues that have to be dealt with and it works. Sometimes it works but I'd say that it should also be, always be linked with other methods to ensure that you're not getting something that's totally off which can be de uh, based on, the if you don't know the background noise characteristics that can have an influence. So if we go into some of those methods, that first step is acquisition. And I said we need to have a robust acquisition. So the active source, as I said, you lay geofounds on the, on the, on the, along the line, you know the source of your energy, you know where that energy is coming from. If you know the energy and the location of everything, then you can characterize uh, the velocities of those surface waves and then work back to characterize your shear wave velocity profile. So that's usually for the near surface. And I'd say with a sledgehammer, you could probably get 20 meters deep, let's say. If you want to get deeper, which we often, often do, you either need a larger source, a drop weight, a T-Rex, if you can afford one, but that's not gonna happen for a long time. Um, then you need to use passive source. And they work really well, but it need, means you use the background energy. There's background energy from everywhere that's traveling in all different directions. If you have a 2D array, all that energy traveling across that array, you know the locations, you know the, the, if you know the locations and how long it takes for the waves of different frequencies to go from one point to the other, you can work out the velocities. It's just all distance and time effectively. Um, you can either use geophones or more expensive broadband seismometers and you can go deep. So as much as a couple of kilometers deep depending on how big you want your array to be. So as I said, the active source, you would have heard those before. The main one is the MASW, you've got a, this is a side view, you've got a source and usually it's 24 or 48 geophones uh, that you will use. So it's, the key thing is, is you would use, a, it's a line along the surface. So you're characterizing the average characteristics underneath that line. So you would get for one setup, you get one velocity profile, which is representative, or one, one set of velocity profiles, I should say, which is representative of the soil underneath that line. And that's just one test. How you, you do that is you set, this is the plan view, you've got a source, you hit the source, hopefully it's got energy over a range of frequencies, and that wave propagates out, as you would expect, like dropping a stone, 
and then you know where that source is, you can look at how that's traveling and you can characterize those velocities. You usually get energy over range of frequencies. Range of frequencies equals range of wavelengths equals range of depths. So that's what you want. And you want a good range. And usually you're probably interested to get as deep as you can. So you want low frequency energy, which gives you long wavelengths to characterize the different depths. As I said, from hopefully having a really big, strong uh, postgraduate student to swing the hammer while I press the button, up to uh, T-Rex shaking around, which you can get obviously deeper again. For this testing, there's a lot of issues that I can't go into, but you, the best practice is to hit the source at different offsets from one side of the line, because if you, hit it, if you just have one location, you can actually end up characterizing things incorrectly. You can end up getting reduced velocities. You can end up getting increased velocities, depending on just the nature of the day. So you'd hit multiple offsets on one side, and then you do it on the other side. And the reason behind this, you don't know if underneath your array, if you've got any sloping surfaces, but if you hit on one side and you hit on the other, you'll be able to see that. Your velocity that you develop, velocity profile that you'll be developed will be different if you just hit on this side compared if you just hit on this side. So it's the same soil beneath this, it's just wherever you hit. If you don't hit on both sides and identify that, if you hit on this side, you might, if you hit on this side, you'll identify that your side is stiffer than what you think. So you're doing a good job. But in reality, it's not. And so it's important to account for that, because if you don't account for that, then you can miss that, and that could be an issue, depending on what's going on in terms of those characteristics. So as I said, both ends of the lathe to account for lateral heterogeneity, multiple offsets from each end of the line to account for near source effects, or also signal to noise ratio effects. That e that, so that could either underestimate or overmate, overestimate, depending on what's going on, and the com combination could affect it as well. You just don't know. So you need to have that robust methodology to try and identify that. So this is all related to just the field, me the me me uh, field methodology. For 2D arrays, again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but here's an example in Christchurch where we did 60, 200, and 400 meter array. Obviously, we're probably going a little bit deeper than your standard project, but if you actually wanted to profile the velocity profile to rock, you're gonna have to do something like that in Christchurch. To be honest, you're gonna have to make a kilometer array to get to, to, to rock in Christchurch depending on how far you are away from the Port Hills. I'm not gonna to talk too much about processing, but the idea is you pull all that together and you use different methodologies and you characterize what is, what is called a dispersion curve and effectively that's sort of a representation of that average velocity as your wavelet gets deeper. I'm not gonna explain that in any more detail on that, but that requires experience to process and clean the data and get it to a point where we think this is representative of our site so we can then take the next step. So this is where sort of you get to the seismic CPT stage and the next step. The key thing is the inversion. So what are you doing in the inversion? So you are trying to match a model of the P and S wave profile of your site to the data you collected in the field. So you might have created these dots, which is your experimental curve. So it's just curve fitting, right? You're fitting a curve of the, well, I say it's just curfing, but it's a little bit more complicated than that, but effectively, you've got your experimental data, and you're trying to fit that experimental data with a theoretical P and S wave velocity profile. And so you can see it's one step further. You're fitting a model to data. It's not sort of run of the mill. This is a very complicated uh, procedure. And the issue, and the why it is, complicated because it's called an ill-posed solution, which means that there's not enough constraints for that solution. There's more unknowns than knowns. So there is actually many, many, many profiles that you could create to fit that curve. They would all be right. So if they can all be right, then you should show that there is a range of profiles that can be right, because that might have an influence on, ha on your design. So that's why you need to have an account for that in studies. You are fitting a model to data, and that model doesn't have enough constraints to actually reduce things down. You can reduce the constraints. Uh, you can reduce the unknowns. So you can reduce the unknowns if you've done subsurface investigations. If you've done subsurface investigations, you know the layering at the site. 
So instead of fitting a model, so you, initially you'll have a model where you can have velocities changing and layering changing as far as you want to allow it. If you know the layering, then only your velocity is changing, but your layering can be fixed. And if you do that, you really collapse down the number of correct profiles. Because you can have a correct, so and a good example here is you could create a model that has from 0 to 30 meters, let's say, that's 0.5 meter thickness layers. And your profile will be all over the show because it will fit that curve perfectly. But is it, re is it real? No, it looks nothing like reality. So you can over constrain as well. So you've all those different aspects. I mean, I've been smacking my head against the wall for seven years thinking about this stuff. It's, every time I look at it more, I get more and more worried. But if you show the uncertainty, then you've done a good job. If you do a surface wave testing and you get a single profile, that's not a good job. And this is just a testing in one location. So here's an example of what stuff we did. So in Christchurch, we tried to fit this profile. So the black with the bars is, is the black is the experimental data plus the uncertainty and that, oh, sorry, the range of that data. And then the red is a profile we fit where we knew nothing about the subsurface. And then the blue is once we investigated the subsurface, we revised that profile. And I'm only going to show one profile here to make it easier for you guys to see for each of those, but there is uncertainty involved in that. So those two fit, them, fit that ex the same. Those two profiles are effectively identical in terms of, you know, the fit here, it's a slight difference, but it's pretty good for both. And both those profiles are a good representation of that experimental data. Of course, there's going to be variability throughout those. But yeah, this is sort of a, uh, and we did this at all the strong motion stations. We did it when we knew nothing, and we did it when we knew something to show how much it could change. So that's what you should see, really, is a profile with, here's my lowest misfit, so that's how well your model fits your data. And then there's my best 100 and my best 1,000 profiles. Maybe we sort of cut it off shallow, but even then you can see at shallow, shallow you're doing a good job, but as you get deeper, things become more uncertain, and you get a bit of, quite a bit of variability in terms of that range. So you should be able to provide that and say, here's all the profiles that fit that data well utilize this in terms of what you'd want to do in terms of your response. So all that's just for one line at one location, hit each side, do the inversion, run through, get the uncertainty. This is a representation of this point average along 46 meters. If you then want to go to 2D color plots, you've got to do that and then you walk along and you do it again. And you can do a hit back and forward, up and down, back side to side, back to front and go through that entire process. If you want a robust measure of your velocities, you can see how much work that is. So you do, you do the test, you do the test, you move along, you do the test, move along, you do the test, move along, and you get one, two, three, four representat representative profiles at each of those locations. Your 2D plots, all they are is they, all they are, is they've taken those locations, which is that 1D profile, and then they've smeared between them. So however far your first array has moved to your next array, you've got the average at the middle of those, and you interpolate and smear in between. So all the stuff in between those isn't real, it's interpolated. And a plot like this has no measure of uncertainty whatsoever. So to do a robust, I, I would never do a, a 2D because it would take me about half a year to process. So I think they're good to give you a general idea of something's changing from stiff to soft, but any of the values that you utilize, you'd have to take with a significant grain of salt. HFB method, again, is a good method. I'll show we've used this quite a bit around the place. Um, HFV, HVSR if you use earthquake records, Nakamura method in the code. So what that is doing is really giving you an estimate of the fundamental uh, period of the soil profile above rock or above a shallow impedance contrast as you'll see that happens a lot. Um, that really requires a good long knowledge of the geological conditions at the site because if you don't know that you could say oh my site period's 0.4 seconds but actually that's just 
five, 10 metres of soil above gravel and then you've got 60 metres of gravel to rock. If you don't pick that up or you don't know that, you can do a really uh, uh, poor job. It's a quick method, it's easy to do. All you're doing is you're measuring the ambient noise in the vertical, horizontal, and horizontal. And if you've got an impedance contrast, which is effectively a combination of density and shear wave velocity of one layer is significantly larger than the combination of density and shear wave velocity in the other layer, you record those background noise, and you should you take the background noise and you do the Fourier spectra and then you take the ratio and what will occur is what you will see is you'll get a peak in that H of a V spectral ratio that aligns with the fundamental period of that profile. So it's just like the fundamental period of a building, you've got stiffness and height, same sort of effective thing. So it's a very quick, easy, single point method. Um, and I think it's a good method if you understand the geological conditions to, to characterise uh, the site period, or, or the, at least the minimum site period, I guess, of the site. I think the issue there is, again, in the inversion, it's probably even more of an ill-posed solution. There's even more unknowns aligned with that. So I would suggest it's probably even more ambiguous to invert that, where, you, again, you've got, you're actually trying to fit that HGV spectral ratio plot with a model. That's the inversion process. And there's huge, I've seen, inter, I've seen people almost punch each other in the face talking about the inversion of that method in conferences overseas. It's quite entertaining to sort of sit in the background. Sometimes the uh, academics get a bit fired up. Um, again, it requires a 1D profile assumption. The issue is it uses the geometric mean of the two horizontal. So this is an example of a site in Wellington where we look at, this is the squared average. If we look at north 60 degrees east and then south 30 degrees east, our H of V spectral ratio moves from 1.7 to 2.1. So it's different depending on what direction you look. And this is because there's slope. But if you fit a model to one or the other, one site in two different directions should have the same 1D velocity profile. So there's a big issue, I think, with the inversion of the H over V method. Okay, so that's all these methods. Uh, and I think the, the, the big thing is to understand what these methods are doing and understand their advantages and limitations. Everything has advantages and limitations. But I think the key thing is you combine a geotechnical and geophysical approaches, you're gonna be doing a good job in terms of moving forward in terms of that best practice. And again, always linking back to the geologic uh, knowledge of the region, because that'll help you to constrain things even more in terms of what you expect. Surface wave methods, I mean, I use them a lot in research and I think they're really good, but you should have a, a Brady sort of described this last week as a healthy fear. You probably have a healthy fear in many things in life, but you should certainly have a healthy fear of surface wave methods, and I definitely do. Uncertainty should always be provided if you're gonna utilize those velocities into feeding things into design. Constrained by subsurface investigation data is key, as is indicated in the code, and if black box software, if you're able to hit a sledgehammer and then in three minutes or 30 seconds get a velocity profile, um, yeah, I hope I've explained that's not really gonna, you shouldn't have too much confidence in terms of that. It's a very involved approach. Okay, so where have we used all this stuff? We've used it all over the place. Um, I've, got a ver I've got a very understanding partner, that's for sure. So let's start at Canterbury and we'll work our way up the country. So characterization of regional deposits, we did the H of V spectral ratio mapping and deep shear wave velocity profiling. So across the, in Christchurch and the Canterbury Plains, we had about 14 sites in Christchurch which did deep shear wave velocity profiling, another 10 out in the plains, and multiple sites where we did our H of V spectral ratio method to try and understand the basin structure. If we looked at the site period in Canterbury, close to the foothills and close to the uh, um, Port Hills, and we'll discuss a little bit more of that. You've got a shorter period, but as you go deeper, you can see we're getting up to periods of about seven seconds. Once you're out uh, in, the, in the plains, it's sort of like six, seven seconds, and up in north of, Can north of Christchurch, it's also around that five to six second mark. Our deep shear wave velocity profiles, again, we're up to a kilometre or more diameter array to characterise those profiles. We constrain them using the velocity model, and the other model that's been developed, and also water wells, et cetera, trying to constrain those layering. And 
we were able to characterize our velocity profiles down to rock using a combination of the spectral ratio method and our active and our passive surface wave methods to try and characterize those profiles. So we have best fit, we have uncertain, we have range in terms of our values, and usually when we get to, to rock, we've got a big uncertainty in terms of where that is, and that's because you're going from stiff to soft, st soft to, st to much stiffer, and that really is very difficult to constrain, and there's certainly always gonna be a range in terms of that. Um, and so we're actually developing representative profiles for the Canterbury Plains, so that could actually be utilized by having the profile plus uncertainty, you could feed that into site response analysis. And so that's been regionally constrained, so it's a good representation. If we take a cross-section, this is where things get really interesting in terms of site period. So this is uh, cross-section through Christchurch. This is the Port Hills. CBD is about here. This is going out to the north of Christchurch. This is the uh, Banks Peninsula Volcanics. So this is from University of Canterbury's velocity model. So you've got your bedrock, and you've got your different sort of undifferentiated layers. You've got your volcanics out here and then you've got the surface layers. So here's, you know, you're going down pretty deep in terms of that. If we do a cross-section out in terms of the site period measurements, if we go close to the Port Hills, you get a really sharp peak there, I think it's about 0.7 seconds. So that's only, say, maybe 150 metres from the base of the Port Hills. You're already past your site class D boundary, and that's the response of the soil profile above the volcanics. And at that location, it's not the overall profile to basement, but in this sense, the overall profile debasement is probably not important or is not going to dictate things. You've got a very thick, stiff layer above here. So it's really that impedance contrast that's going to cause that amplification or the, the change in that response. If we move further out, we get two peaks. Now we have about 20 metres of soft soil over the stiff gravel, over the ricketing gravels. That creates an impedance contrast. So that creates sort of a period of response of that 20 meters above that stiff gravel. So we pick up that in this peak here. Now we also pick up another peak, which is deeper still. It's the entire profile down to that volcanic rock interface. So we're characterizing that too. But again here, we're not seeing anything in terms of the deep response. There's no peak showing us that that overall basin is affecting things. If we go further again, we now see three peaks. So now, again, we've got that shallow, soft layer over about 20 metres. Now we've got another sort of weaker peak here where we're doing the, which is the impedance contrast over that volcanics. But now that volcanics become thin enough and may not be, in, again, for these measurements, we're not measuring a single point, it's a region that you're, you're characterising. And so now we're also getting a real clear peak showing up here, which we believe is now the overall profile to bedrock. So you're getting Shallow, volcanics, overall profile to bedrock. And those are all potentially influencing things in terms of the earthquake record. So in the CBD, we saw amplifications that were occurring due to this response at around that two to three second, which would be the response above that volcanics. We didn't really see too much amplification out further in here, particularly for the Darfield earthquake. If we move out further again, now we lose the volcanics. The volcanics are there, we think, but they're not consistent enough to create an impedance contrast that is causing that amplification. So now we get the shallow response here at about 0.5, 6 sec 0.6 seconds, and now we really can see that the overall soil profile to, to rock there at a six second peak. And so up in the northwest of Canterbury, if you look at the earthquake records, there is an amplification in the spectra due to that overall soil profile. And if we move away from we're having any soft deposits out by the airport, we just characterize it's gravel from the surface the only impedance contrast is at the bedrock, so you don't capture anything high on the surface. So I guess calling that complex is a good way to describe it, but yeah, there's a lot going on there, and there are different areas, different impedance contrasts affected different things in terms of amplification, which obviously all feeds into how we characterise things for design. So there's another way to show it. This is the response above gravel. It's you know around 0.45 to about 0.65 seconds, which is that... Um, the material over the ricket and gravels. And if we look in, a, in a, another sense, we've got the period, of the period of response over the volcanic rock where it exists, and as we move further out, we characterize the response above the basement. So it gets deep pretty quick. Um, the site class E is a weird one because it sort of 
should, I guess, be a catch-all for difficult deposits. If we're thinking about the response of a saw column, so you've got stiffness and depth, this is equal to this is equal to this, but this is our boundary. So potentially if we had 9.5 metres of material that was 145 metres a second, it's not a site class E, which makes no sense whatsoever. Unfortunately, maybe fortunately, we don't measure too much shear wave velocities at that point, so it didn't really make a difference, but, you know, we need to be thinking about this in terms of what's the point of having that there is to capture these problem sites and feed them into further assessments that's required. So if we look across Christchurch, we can see if we just use SPT, everything's D away from the hills apart from these two. If we add in the velocity, we change quite a bit in terms of capturing more. So we can see time and time again, this has been shown overseas, that your invasive meth your CPT and your SPT-based methods aren't going to characterise things the same as your velocity methods, but what dictates site response is your shear wave velocity, so really you should be utilising that. For that T0 transition, the only site that would be affected is that location there in Christchurch. VS30, people have talked about this. I think VS30 is just as bad as everything else. No, every code's got it wrong and they've all got it right. So there's still a lot of work to be done to decide what's the best thing to do. You can capture this variation a bit more, but it doesn't capture the overall soil profile because everything's deeper than 30 metres. So none of that would dictate response in terms of differentiating things. So the US code, doesn't really matter what it is because they're all liquefiable. So they're all classified site class F, which further more, invest, more studies are required. So Christchurch is fun. Um, so we'll go to Auckland because uh, we're here and that's also interesting. So the waterfront and then some of the regional deposits. So waterfront was interesting. My uh, master student did a really good job. She characterised, with all the investigation data, she characterised first and created a depth to the ECBF, or the unweathered ECBF surface across the waterfront, as you can see there. She did that first and then she went out and did geophysical investigations to see how does the site period, how does the H of V spectral ratio method work in terms of capturing that variability. So she went out there and ran all over the place and did a really good job. Job also did some active source surface wave testing because it was shallow enough just to use that. And that's our variability in terms of our fundamental site period that we have measured uh, across that region. And you can see that as the colours change, it was pretty similar to the change in the colours in terms of those buried river channels. So it did a really good job. And you can see that you know, you're sort of transitioning as you get far away in terms of some of these old valleys into site class D, site class C. And then this is an accounting for site class E, which is another matter entirely. In the south, I've got a PhD student who's uh, playing with some of this really soft stuff uh, out in Takinini. So she's doing work characterising all those different deposits, a lot of different investigations to characterise representative shear wave velocity depth profiles for the different Auckland deposits. What we have is some real soft stuff. So if we go out to Takinini, site class E is 10 metres of less than 150 metres a second. We've measured 20 metres less than 150 metres a second. We've measured 20 metres less than 110 metres a second. So I don't know how you put that into a sort of uh, NZS 170.5 context. It's interesting, it's difficult, the amplification is significant. Mining blasts in the Hanuas get reported as earthquakes because it's that soft. And that's where our city's expanding to, so that's also interesting. Uh, volcanic stiff over soft, again, interesting. So what we find in terms of this is we've got Basalt, which can be fractured or intact. We've got the soft Tauranga group, which can be you know, different ranges of soft, and then over ECBF, uh, whether that's a rock or not. Again, let's not go into it. Um, but what we find is if we were to look at the ratio of our site class B versus our site class C spectra for the code, because the combination of the velocity and the thickness of the basalt versus the combination of the velocity and the, and the shear wave velocity, velocity and the thickness of the Tauranga group means that depending on the period of the structure at your site, you might be a site class C or you might be a site class B. So in Auckland, with the volcanics at the surface, site classification becomes structural period dependent, which is another little interesting complication to deal with. So hopefully in a year, my PhD student will have solved that and we'll all know what to do. But yeah, so that's yeah, very, very interesting thing to try and deal with. Uh, moving to Nelson Tasman, I go, it's a nice sunny place, so it's a good place to do field testing and visit my students. So I've got a student uh, working on that and we'll finish at the end of this year in terms of 
regional site characterization again and characterizing the typical deposits. So we collected all the investigation data across the region that we could and we did a lot of site period and we've done uh, circular arrays up to 200 meters to characterize a few hundred meters down into the soil deposits. When we did our HFV spectral ratios, we found we could see nothing with depth. We knew from seismic surveys that have been done in the region that it's deep, deep, very, very deep to the base of that, that basin, you know, over a kilometer. <coughs> However, when we go and do our spectral ratio me measurements, we can't get anything longer than maybe a second. And most of the time it's sort of like 2, 3 sec 0 0.2, 0 0.3 seconds. So all we're able to capture is the soft material over a shallow impedance contrast. And then we, and so that method is not able to actually characterize and map that basin. And then we go, we go in and do our velocity profiles, we find the stuff is real stiff. So this is a clay bound gravel that when we get into it, we're looking at sort of up to a thousand meters a second, pretty shallow. But if you took a sample of it and did a UCS test, it wouldn't have an unconfined compressive strength greater than one MPA. So it's <coughs> not a rock. So how, what do we do and what's important in terms of site amplification? So we have no significant impedance contrast with depth because that stuff's getting really stiff with depth. So when you hit the rock, there's not a significant difference, enough of a significant difference to create an amplification. So then this becomes another interesting study of how do we then, what, what should we classify this location or these sites as if we've got this very stiff material that's not a rock and there will be amplification through it, but where does that amplification going to occur? So yeah, we're, we're picking a lot of interesting sites to certainly do some work. And I think you'll find that all over New Zealand. So Wellington is the most recent stuff that we've been doing, and this has also been very interesting. So there's all the spectral ratio measurements we've done. There's more than that now since November. I think we're at about 350. Um, I'm not showing you any data related to that because we're still working it out. This is some interesting stuff. So green is deep, deeper, blue is shallower. And so we're seeing all sorts of interesting, let's call them structures, um, at the subsurface. So we're seeing it's much deeper here and it shallows as we go this way, it shallows as we go this way, and there's, uh, let's say, old stream channels potentially and some other structures that we're seeing going through. So um, as you move further away, uh, the site period sort of, longer site period we're measuring is about two point something seconds. Um, yeah, so that's will come out soon. Hopefully by the end of this year we'll have a new map to outline what's going on. But again, there's a lot of interesting stuff. It's, a, it's about as far away from 1D as you can get in terms of the utilization of this method. But that di directionality we can actually use to try and understand the structure with depth as well. So we're using the directionality of those site period measurements to characterize where we think things are going. And we actually sort of think that some of the damage that we've seen may be due to some of this underground structure and focusing of energy. So a long way to go there, but we'll get there. And we're doing deep velocity profiles. So got to do some testing. Don't worry, I didn't smack the sledgehammer on basin reserve. I, I broke my own rules by only hitting on one side, but that was because I couldn't hit on the other side. So we hit on the concrete to test here, and we did 50 and 100 meter diameter arrays in basin reserve and other areas we're currently developing. Uh, velocity profiles of those regional deposits. I guess the interesting thing here is we can go and do all these 1D characterizations, and I think that's important, and we have to, it's the, it's the sort of the best that we can do currently now, and we can characterize our site. And so here's all the strong motion stations that we have across Wellington, and these are the site period that we've measured with a couple of different methods. For the Cook Strait earthquake sequence, the amplification in our spectra sort of bang on to these site periods at every single location. But for the Kaikoura earthquake, here's the spectra at each of those sites. So the blue and the red is in each orthogonal direction. So you can see there's quite big differences in some of those orthogonal directions. And that's again due to the three dimensional nature of the subsurface. If we put those 1D periods on there, the amplifications don't really match at all with that 1D period is what you'd expect. So this is this basin, basin edge effect, or the, the broader basin response where you're getting amplification that isn't dictated by your 1D profile, it's the broader basin characteristics that is rating. And this will totally relate the energy for the earthquake, the energy content for different earthquakes will cause 
different amplification effects. So this is part of ongoing work to try and understand this. Plenty of other regions bouncing all over the place, and I think there's you know, a lot of interesting stuff that we're still building up and, and trying to pull together. So, side effects prevalent in past earthquakes, I think we all agree with that. To try to understand that, we need to back calculate and understand the profile below those to then understand that and move forward and apply it to other areas where we haven't recorded ground motions. But we need to do a robust approach to that. We need to understand the limitations and the advantages of those different geophysical methods, and I think really it should be a requirement to use geophysical methods for site classification. Um, feeding into that, we've got a heap of regional studies, and I think you know there's a lot of interesting things going on. The basin effects, these difficult deposits, uh, how do we represent them in terms of standards and design, because that's you know we have to put this into a framework that's easy enough to use. Uh, and I think really a big thing is the development of these regional velocity models. If we want to capture these broader three-dimensional sense, I think the research community has to be able to develop tools that can actually do that. I don't think any one firm can develop a velocity model of, of different regions. I don't know how you'd get funded to do that to start with. You don't have cheap labour in the form of students, which really help the things. So yeah, I think that's really we need to tie together and work to that. And I think uh, a lot of this work that we're, we're collecting will also look to feed into the NZGD in the future.